Good afternoon, everyone. It is 2 o'clock, and so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Daryl Griffin. I'm with IEEE USA staff, and I will be assisting with today's webinar. Before we get started, I have two, just two housekeeping rules I would like to go over with you. First, please look at the top right-hand corner of your screen. You will see a little icon that says chat. Please click that icon. You will see that the icon is turned blue and the chat box has, chat box has popped up in the lower right-hand portion of your screen. You will use this chat pod to submit your questions to the speaker. You can submit your questions anytime during the webinar, and the speaker will try to address those questions during the webinar or at the conclusion of his remarks. Second, if you have to attend to other business, such as phone calls or other personal conversations, please disconnect from the webinar to address other business and reconnect to the webinar when that other business is concluded. Those are just the two housekeeping rules. Um, Giovanni Bellini is the founder of Rocket Interview, where his team helps job seekers ace the most competitive interviews. Prior to this, he was an associate partner at McKinsey and & Company and served as VP of a digital marketing company. The persistent thread through his career has been helping people tell, tell compelling narratives, whether in the boardroom, for, for a marketing campaign, or a job interview. I will turn it over to the speaker. Thank you, Darren. Well, um, excited to be chatting with you guys today, and um, I was very happy when uh, Daryl reached out and offered up the opportunity to chat about something that is uh, very near and dear to my heart. So. What I thought I would do is, um, you know, the sort of broader conversation is around how do you ace any interview, and specifically some of the nuances around phone interviews. Um, so let's dig in. Um, and by the way, as Daryl mentioned, feel free to send questions along the way, and I will either um, sort of pause to answer them in the moment or try to answer them at the end, depending. So I wanted to share four quick facts with you um, and talk through their implications. So the first one is that 60% um, of interviewers decide on a candidate in those first few minutes, specifically the first sort of five to 15 minutes. And so the implication for that is that it's very important that you have a very clear elevator pitch describing your experience, why you're a good fit for the role, and very importantly, why you're interested in this specific opportunity. Um, and you want to have that in less than four minutes. Uh, on a phone interview, I would have that be even quicker because the person interviewing you doesn't actually have any stimuli to go off of. They're not seeing you. They don't get any nonverbal body language. So um, this becomes particularly critical in a phone interview. So that's point one. Point two is that um, you, on average, you're one of 250 people applying for a job. Now, that depends on industry and function, but um, more and more uh, jobs are becoming more competitive. And so there are 249 people that are out of your control. And the implication for that is that you want to elucidate the best parts of your candidacy just to get to that first step, which is the phone interview. And so I'll, I'll show something here in a little bit that talks through how to bring out the best of your candidacy in a resume and make sure it tells a story and is not just distilling a set of facts. Um, the third thing is that there are many formats of interviews, right? There's technical, there's behavioral, there's experience-based, there's panel interviews, there's, there's tons of ways that employers will assess candidates. But one aspect of interviewing that is becoming more important and more common is this behavioral aspect. Uh, it's becoming very common that employers are asking themselves not just, have you been successful in the past? Um, is your experience relevant? But uh, what they're finding is a bigger indicator of how successful you'll be in your organization is how you have gone about doing your work. So behavioral interviewing is really meant to elucidate the how um, not just the what. So I'll talk through some, some very tactical implications for that a little bit. And then the last part is, you know, the phone interview itself. Um, it's ubiquitous um, for a couple reasons. Number one, more and more teams are geographically dispersed. So the idea of, you know, having a candidate come into a specific office, coordinating 
uh, all kinds of people around that is actually a pretty hefty task. So phone interviews just tend to be more efficient. Um, and two is it's a great way to get a lot of people at the top of the recruiting funnel and get a broad set of candidates by just making it easier to coordinate that, especially where most candidates are actually passive job seekers. So getting them to leave their job to come in for a possible opportunity is, is particularly tough. So, so let's dive into some of the um, implications for this. So, so the first one, as I mentioned before, 60% of interviewers are deciding on a candidate very quickly. And so one thing that you can do very practically to set yourself up um, is to have a story that, as you see on the bottom, has three core attributes to it. One is that it's synthesized, right, which means you can explain your experience in less than four minutes. Um, and two, that it's structured, right, uh, and the structure is actually very important. Uh, often what I see is candidates come into an interview they're not really sure how to describe their experience, what to leave out, what to include. And so often what they do is they just sort of go through a list of facts as quickly as they can. Um, and the interviewer is not able to really digest those. So this idea of chunking up your story, you can imagine chunking it up into chapters where you say, well, in my early career I did X, in my mid-career I did Y, and now I'm doing Z. Um, or rather than chunking it up chronologically, you could chunk it up functionally, right? I'll give the example of a marketer who, you know, might say, hey, I spent my early career on marketing analytics, or rather I've done three things. One is marketing analytics, two is campaign execution, and three is integrating marketing strategy. So chunking it up either functionally or chunking it up chronologically will help the interviewer digest it. Um, because it is not about trying to maximize the throughput that you can communicate in less than four minutes, but you're really trying to maximize the comprehensibility and relevance of what it is uh, you're articulating. The third, probably the most common thing I see candidates leaving out when they're talking about their candidacy is why they actually want the job. I would say roughly 90% of the people that I do a first talk interview with um, never actually say, and here's why I'm interested in your company, here's why I'm interested in this role, here's what excites me about this. And, and the reason this is very critical um, is for two reasons. Number one, most candidates are passive job seekers. And so recruiters know this, and they're listening for the cues that suggest you're not just taking a call for the sake of taking a call, but you are actively interested, right? Because when they hand you over to the hiring manager or to the next stage, now not only are you being evaluated, but the recruiter is being evaluated by the hiring manager and, the, and, and others in the organization in terms of are they bringing quality candidates through the funnel? And if it feels like you're not interested, the recruiter um, is, is gonna be less motivated to sort of put you forward. So. Don't wait for that question. Often you won't be asked it. You should proactively be looking to answer it. Um, and then a couple other things at the top of this page, what you'll see is, you know, just to bring this home, the reason this is very critical, these first five plus minutes, is that this idea of confirmation bias. Imagine you walk into an interview, you tell a very crisp, compelling, clear story, and you move through uh, the rest of the interview, if you really nail that first part, they're automatically tuning their brain to prove out why you're a good candidate. As opposed to if in those first few minutes it just sounded like you're not excited, it sounded like you're not clear, um, if there was some cognitive disconnect, then they're looking for to prove why you're not a good fit, right? And when there is 250 candidates, really the efficient thing to do is to look for all the reasons why somebody is not a good candidate, because that's just the easiest thing to do. So that's why you know this idea of confirmation bias is, is one to think about, because those first few minutes are gonna have an exponentially uh, higher impact on how you're perceived throughout the, the rest of the interview process, right? The, the, the second thing I'll say is about that is, there is this idea of pattern recognition. So depending how you frame your story, people are very quickly trying to you know, categorize what your candidacy looks like, right? So they, 
based on how you tell your story, they might say, oh, okay, I get it. This is an analytics person. Oh, okay, I get it. This is a technical person, but not a people leader person. So that pattern recognition, which is just an efficient cognitive function for an interviewer, sets in. So this is your opportunity to um, sort of set the right path as opposed to having them assume and fill in the gaps on things. So let's go to the next one. Um, you know, this point I made earlier, which is you have roughly 250 applicants per job. And um, one of the things that I, that I often see is, you know, people put a resume together and it has a set of facts, it's organized by chronology and by role, but it doesn't tell a story. Um, when you look at each bullet on there, um, not only does it have to have the hygiene around being synthesized, the hygiene around uh, being parallel, but you know people are are glancing it in under 30 seconds to look for the story, right? And when you think about each bullet, each bullet should strive to explain both the input, so this is what I did, and the output. I see a lot of resumes where um, it either says what somebody did or it has the output, but it doesn't connect the input to the output, right? And to the extent that you can say, here's what I did and here's the result, not only does that tell a clear story, but it actually um, can potentially differentiate you from others where they only have inputs or they only have outputs. You know, if you're able to connect the dots there, it, it, it's a way to differentiate yourself. Um, often what I hear people saying about outputs as well I can't really quantify the output. I know it was good, but I don't, you know, I don't have the specific number. And so two things I always tell people about that is one, it's very reasonable to estimate a range. Um, so to say, hey, this had a 20 to 40% impact on something is very reasonable. The second thing is um, a lot of candidates I'm talking to, they say, well, um, you know, this project is still underway. The results haven't come in yet. So I don't really know uh, how successful it's going to be. And to that, I, I, I'll, I'll guide people and say, well, just put in the targeted results, right? At least let me know this is a meaningful venture that you've embarked on. Even if you don't know the exact output, you at least know what the targeted output is. And that's a way to at least, you know, dimensionalize the value at stake. The other piece is that um, more and more what I'm seeing is people are applying to a range of jobs right? Um, maybe you're a software engineer, but you're also applying for a product manager job, as an example. And often what people do is they have one core version of their resume. And, and there's, there's two things you want to think about. One is um, for the types of jobs I'm applying to, where there is material differences, you want to have a different base version of that resume that's telling a story with the language that is more specific to that job. So you want that base version. So you might have two or three base versions depending how many different job, different types of jobs you're applying for. But the second thing is even for a specific company, um, how specific companies look at a specific role varies, right? So I'll take my example of marketing earlier. You know, there could be a company hiring for a marketing campaign manager and maybe one company wants somebody very analytically heavy. Another one wants somebody very creative, and another one wants somebody very strategic. And now those aren't mutually exclusive, but if you know the bend that they're looking for, you know, you only have one to two pages on your resume to tell your story. You've left a lot of things out. You have used certain language to connect with them. You know, the best thing to do is to go and make those tailored language choices to match the flavor of the job description for that employer. So you might have a base resume for a specific type of job, but then for each employer, you might want to make some nuanced language changes just so that they can, because they're looking at this resume in less than 30 seconds, so they can quickly see that language that resonates with them and then say, okay, yeah, that roughly matches what I was thinking about. Um, the, last, the last piece I'll mention is that, um, you want to be thinking about what is the top line synthesis of your candidacy. A lot of good resumes have a few bullets up front that summarizes somebody's candidacy. And a lot of times what I see is people will say something to the effect of, you know, I'm a strong-willed, determined, results-oriented person. Um, 
And those are qualifying attributes about you, but what will be even more powerful, I mean, you can have that, but you want to couple that with really dimensionalizing your experience, right? So if you're saying, look, I'm an analytically focused uh, operations manager who has led teams of 10 to 20 people um, and focuses on coaching, culture improvement, and process efficiency. As an example, you want to get some specific things in there that don't just describe vaguely your characteristics, but very precisely how you intend to add value and how you have added value. Um, and that's the kind of thing that really pops. The headline is something that is always read on a resume, whereas each individual bullet, um, not every bullet's going to be read. Uh, by the way, uh, feel free to send questions as I'm going through this. The content is uh, fairly thick, so happy to, you know, take any questions along the way. Um, okay. So let's get into uh, behavioral interviewing, as I talked about earlier. So uh, just sort of demystifying what behavioral interviewing is for a moment, there are over two to 300 questions you can get asked in a behavioral interview. But those questions largely are distilled into five themes, right? There's questions about leadership, questions about conflict resolution, questions around accomplishment, questions around problem solving, and finally teamwork. And what I generally encourage people to do is rather than trying to predict every possible permutation of question you might get asked, it's actually more efficient and in many ways more productive to take a step back and figure out what are three to four really strong stories I have. And each story should be applicable to more than one theme, right? So often a good conflict story can be a good leadership story, as an example. A good um, problem-solving story could also be an accomplishment story. The idea is to have a suite of stories that have uh, something compelling to them where the actions are impactful and the results are meaningful. And if you have a handful of stories, no matter what prompt you get asked, you could flexibly leverage that story to answer most questions, right? So imagine if you had a story where uh, your team was going through some adversity, you were trying to launch a new product, you lost a lot of resources, and you had to dig in and, and, and be very entrepreneurial to get something done with limited resources, right? You can imagine that that story has tremendous leadership to it, right? Uh, you could also imagine there was conflict and tension and you solved that as well. And you could also imagine that, you know, you were solving a complicated problem with a lot of constraints around it. So you could, there could be many questions that you get asked and you could leverage that story to answer that question. So naturally then the question becomes, well, what is the best way to answer a behavioral question? And I'm sure many people have heard of the STAR framework, situation, task, action, result. Um, I like to leverage a slightly modified framework and just combine the situation and task into context. And, and roughly speaking, you want to spend less than 20% on context, within 20% on results, and the rest on actions. And the three things you want to do in the story is just set, set, the, set the ground for what this story is about in the context, and more importantly, make sure they understand why this is important. Often I see people jumping into the story and it's not clear that there's something that's significant or there's some big value at stake that they're targeting. So I don't know why this is important, right? So that's step one. As an interviewer, I wanna know why it's important. Step two is, as you're going through your actions, make sure you are mapping them to skills that are relevant to the prompt, for example, leadership or conflict, and ideally uh, skills that are relevant to the job, right? So imagine if you're telling, talking about a conflict story, which is you know, what we'll talk about in a moment, um, you want to be talking through the core actions you took, right? How did you bring people together? How did you advocate for others? How did you close the gap on the tension? 
how did you build trust? Like you, you really want to break those actions down. I think often what people do is they are focusing more on telling the story and not focused enough on highlighting their part in that story. And that's what the action is all about, which is frankly the most important part. Um, and often what I see is people talk about the context, they see the act, they talk about the action, and then they end the story by saying, and it worked out, it was a good result. Um, but really what you wanna do is take a moment, take your victory lap around the story and actually express why this was an important result, what the result was and why it's meaningful. So there are three of the five themes, three are the most common you're likely going to get in a phone interview. So I'm gonna go over those. Um, the first is uh, the leadership theme. So the first misconception I think people have whenever they're asked a question about leadership, a question that might be like, tell me about a time you demonstrated leadership, is people automatically connote that with managing people. And I have a lot of people who say, well, I haven't actually directly managed a team. I wasn't, I don't actually own responsibility for them. And, and managing is not the same thing as leadership. Um, really, the question is about how have you influenced others, impacted others, coached them, right? This is all about help, helping others deliver on something with you being a force multiplier on their output, right? So, so take a step back and ask yourself, how, how, have I, how have I helped others do their job better or get to a good outcome? It's more important to talk about that and less important to highlight, you know, a time when you were the quote unquote boss. Um, the, the question is asked numerous ways. They may either ask directly about demonstrating leadership or leading a team, or it might be a little bit more vague where they might ask you to discuss, uh, discuss your leadership style or an interesting nuance that I'm seeing happen more frequently is how would others describe your leadership style? And the nuance there is they're looking for your level of self-awareness about your leadership style. Um, but ultimately, regardless of the nuance of the question, you know, on the right-hand side of the page, I've, I've highlighted some of the actions and some of the results you wanna highlight. So going back to our framework, there's the context, there's the actions and then there's the results. And so the type of actions that are that tend to be very uh, relevant uh, tend to be things around motivating others, coaching people, uh, influencing stakeholders, right? Stakeholders could be cross-functional, they could be clients, they could be uh, people outside of, uh, of the enterprise. Uh, the fourth one, specifically collaborating cross-functionally, I think is actually a critical one to think about. Um, more and more, organizations are uh, have a matrix structure where there's a lot of people that have a dotted line reporting to somebody else and they have somebody that is giving them direction but is not officially their quote unquote boss. And so to the extent you can highlight how you collaborate cross-functionally, especially for large enterprises, um, that, is, that is the type of leadership that especially mid to larger companies are really looking for. Um, Another interesting one is, you know, when you think about leadership from the perspective of not just leading a team to do something, but also instilling behaviors and how it impacts culture, uh, that's another interesting lens to apply to a, to a leadership story. Um, in terms of results to highlight, I think the obvious one is the business objective that you solved, whether it was getting a product into market, driving revenue, reducing cost. And, and you can include that in any behavioral interviewing story. That's you know what I consider table stakes. But where your results can really differentiate you from other people is to the extent your results talk about the growth in others, their professional development, their growth in their role, um, and then how have these things been adopted by them so that they continue to scale, right? How have they adopted a new behavior, a new habit? Some of the most compelling leadership stories I hear show a story where a person or a team is fundamentally behaving and operating with a new structure, a new mindset, and, and a new process. So those are the type of results that will show amplification above and beyond just a business result. 
Um, by the way, just a reminder, feel free to send questions. Uh, happy, to, happy to answer anything that, uh, that comes up. Um, second important theme, and this is one that I see people shying away from all the time, uh, and it is one of the most common questions you get, especially in phone interviews, which is, tell me about a time you resolved conflict or uh, disagreed with somebody, you know, anything that shows that you have to um, sort of solve for some discord or some disconnect. And, and it's asked in a variety of ways, whether it's between you and a peer or a supervisor or a direct report. Um, sometimes, you know, they'll specifically be looking for something behavioral or personality oriented versus just a disagreement of ideas. Um, and I think what is incredibly critical here is this is not about you having a story of how you won a conflict, right? This is not about saying, hey, there was a disagreement and, and my point of view won. This is really an exercise in explaining how you go about resolving this conflict, right? Um, some of the most compelling stories I hear are people talk about tackling it head on, being vulnerable, having that difficult conversation, uh, bringing data and an objective point of view to the answer, maybe pulling somebody else in that uh, that can help be an independent party, um, and you know some of the uh, other traits that you're you're really also thinking about is not just what did you do, but how did the other person feel? Um, you know some of the great stories I typically hear is where somebody has a conflict with another person. They build trust with them. They build a relationship. They they take them outside of uh, the office, and maybe they're grabbing coffee with them to understand their point of view. Um, and then they build a fruitful relationship in the long term. So not only do they solve the near term conflict, but they build this uh, strong partnership going forward. So, what are the type of actions you want to be highlighting? I think you know, the most uh, probably critical action is communication, right? Um, and, and not just the fact that you're having that communication, but the style of communication, the frequency of communication, right, how proactive you are about, about communicating. Uh, empathizing is another important one. Almost all conflict stories have some element of connecting with the other person and understanding their point of view. And even if you fundamentally disagree with it, saying, well, I, I get where you're coming from, I can understand that. Um, but there has to be some element of, of showing that in a conflict story. Um, you know, typically there's some element of problem solving and getting to a solution. Um, and then, and then also, you know, negotiating, uh, and getting to a mutually desirable outcome. Uh, the results, you know, this is where I think it's, there's actually a significant opportunity to talk about results that persist beyond this one conflict encounter. Things that lift the culture of the team, that bring the team closer together, um, or, or drive a, a long-term, uh, stronger collaboration will all be very compelling results to highlight. Because one of the questions the interviewer is asking themselves when you're going through a conflict story is, you know, they're expecting there to be conflict. And it's, it's actually a healthy trait of most organizations. So they're asking themselves, well, when you encounter conflict in our organization, how will that impact how you collaborate with others? So the extent you can show how you've done that elsewhere and how transferable that is, um, that will sort of check the box for the, for the employer and the interviewer to say, yes, you would be a good cultural fit. Uh, moving along, the third theme I wanted to cover on behavioral interviewing, another common question is when you're asked about an accomplishment. They might say uh, an accomplishment you're proud of, and your greatest one. They might frame it as professional or personal or leave it open. And what's interesting about this is it's, it's a more open-ended question than leadership or conflict, the prior two we just discussed. And um, there's, there's, there's one thing here I think that is fundamentally a little bit different that you're signaling to the interviewer that you're not doing in the other behavioral questions, which is you're actually signaling a little bit about what it is you value, right? Um, this is a great question I used to love asking candidates because 
you would very quickly get a sense for what gives them energy, right? Is there, is there accomplishment story about enabling others? Is it about winning big clients? Is it about driving revenue? Is it about innovating? Um, and, and the reason that's important is, you know, every job has a certain bend towards certain types of accomplishments. And so um, it's helpful to know what type of accomplishments uh, a candidate gets energy from. The, the second thing is um, this actually gives you a very broad range of skills and actions you can highlight. So whereas leadership and conflict, you know, there, there are, I would say, some more common ingredients that you're going to highlight, uh, the accomplishment story could be highlighting uh, a broader variety of things, right? It could be talking about being resilient, about building and creating a product. It could be talking about reaching out to customers and clients. Um, it, it really allows you to focus in on things you want to tell, you want to describe about your candidacy. So it's, I, I consider it a, a fairly blank canvas of a question where you can leverage it not just to tell the story you want to tell, but potentially to open up further dialogue. Um, you know, the, the last part in terms of the results you want to highlight, um, clearly you want to, uh, you know, talk about the impact it had on maybe somebody else or the customer or product. But I think what often people leave out is the why, right? Why are you proud of this accomplishment is actually a very critical question to answer, right? So to the extent you're saying, well, you know, the reason I'm proud of this is because you know, I really love seeing others succeed, or I really love having a discrete goal, tackling it, and, and, and moving on to the next one. You're really giving them insight into how you tick, how you operate, and not just what you've done. So I think the why, um, why you value it is, is actually very critical. So now I wanna bring a lot of this home specifically for the phone interview, right? Um, so let's take a step back and, and think about the construct of a phone interview. It's roughly 30-ish minutes over the phone, most often with a person from HR, so they don't know about the role as deeply as the hiring manager or somebody in the group might know about it. Um, and sometimes it might be the hiring manager as well. But, but really, this is a first screen. Really what they're asking themselves is less about evaluating how good you are and how great you might be, and they're more asking themselves a binary question. So it's less of a spectrum, where do you sit on the spectrum, and more of a binary, is this somebody we think warrants further conversation? So what are the three things they're looking for? One, are you actually interested? And as I mentioned, 80% of job seekers are passive, right? HR. Uh, and hiring managers will reach out to people on LinkedIn, and they very quickly want to suss out whether you're just on this call because they reached out to you, or you're on this call because not only did they reach out to you, but you're in a place in your career where you're interested in making a move, and this opportunity really speaks to you. Um, there's a lot of candidates that use this as practice, and people can get a quick sense of, when you haven't really prepared for the phone interview, and this is more a practice or a serendipitous conversation as opposed to something you're really trying to ace. So number one is you really want to hit that interest thing right out the ballpark, right? So even at the beginning, you know, being clear about, hey, glad you reached out to me. This is really exciting for reasons A, B, and C. You know, doing that as opposed to being more vague and saying, um, yeah, you know, I just wanted to learn more. Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that can signal that your interest is, is deeper and discreet. Um, so, you know, it, it, you want to make sure you've looked at the company's website, you understand their business, you've looked at their products, you've looked at their services, you've checked them out on Glassdoor. I think often people wait to do that research till after the phone interview. Um, and, and I think after the phone interview, you can go deeper on that, but you definitely have to have that at least uh, first level insight before that phone interview. The second thing they're asking themselves is, 
uh, think of it almost as a word cloud, right? They're, they're sort of asking themselves, am I hearing this person having the core skills I'm looking for, right? Uh, all they've really seen is your LinkedIn, maybe your resume, but it doesn't tell a full story. So, you know, they're looking for small little things uh, potentially the, uh, to, to get a sense on, you know, have you done X, have you done Y? Uh, have you done SQL? Uh, you know, have you worked with uh, an ERP platform? They're just trying to get a quick rough sense on are these things you've been exposed to? Like I said, a binary question, less of a spectrum question. So that's the kind of thing you want to make sure you've already looked at the job description, you know what they're looking for. Um, and even if it's something that you may not be deeply skilled in, just, you know, demonstrating that you have some fluency or some knowledge of it uh, can be good because, as I said, it's more about checking that box than it is about, you know, getting a, a top grade on it. Um, and the other thing that is a little bit more uh, subtle is just in the way you're communicating with them, your demeanor, uh, they're getting a sense for are you a good cultural fit? Right, um, and then when they're asking you about your experience, they're trying to connect the dots between the environments you've worked in uh, and their environment, right? So they're trying to get a sense of, have you worked in a fast-paced environment? Have you worked somewhere where it's a, maybe a flatter culture or a matrix culture? They're looking for those things. So that to the extent you can connect the dots between that, um, that's another thing that will flag to them the relevancy of your background. So let's talk about five things that you should do to, to ace this part of the interview. Um, number one, uh, remember that the interviewer, they're, they're just on the phone. In some cases, they may be on video, but often they're on the phone. And I can almost guarantee you that they're at least partially distracted, right? There are people walking by them. They might be looking on their phone. Emails are popping up. So unlike an in-person or even a video interview, they don't have that accountability to be focused on you because you would see if they're doing other things. So it's very, very critical that you're synthesized, right? So, you know, being very buttoned up, precise, and efficient in your language is actually more critical in a phone interview. Whereas in person, you can get away with being a little bit more verbose because you're actually engaging two-way. Um, so synthesis, I think, is, is very critical. Uh, two is you really want to hit it out of the ballpark on why the company, why the role. Those two questions need to be at the forefront of your thinking, and you want to be very precise, right? It shouldn't be uh, often what I hear people say is, well, you know, I think that your industry is interesting, your company is interesting, you're doing cool things, and you could, you know, ask yourself, is my why something I would say for a lot of companies or many companies, and if it is, then it's not a real answer. It's a boilerplate answer. Um, the third thing, it's fascinating. Uh, a lot of a lot of candidates who are in a phone interview, they'll take it on their couch or, you know, uh, outside walking around while there's traffic in the background, um, or you know, leaning back <laughs> in their bed. And, and I think what's you know, what, what you miss in that is you're not sort of in the moment. You're not simulating the polish you would have and gravitas you would have uh, as if you were in person, sitting upright, in a professional setting. So, you know, making sure that you're simulating this environment, that this is a real professional interview, um, it will make it more professional, less casual. Posture is a really big thing. A lot of people in phone interviews have poor posture because the other person can't see them. And that impacts not just your energy, but your ability to project your voice. It impacts your body language. It impacts your, you know, your likelihood in smiling, which, by the way, people can hear a smile through the phone. Um, so those are all important things to consider is just because it's over the phone doesn't mean you shouldn't behave as if it were in person. Um, the other thing is you know, just because a lot of times in a phone interview, somebody may have reached out to you. Just because they reached out to you doesn't mean that you should be approaching this any differently than if you had reached out to them. So you want to be asking questions at the end, and you're not going to have a ton of time, especially in a phone interview, but you want to be asking questions that, that demonstrate a level of thought more than asking transactional questions, right? So often candidates will spend time asking about, 
next steps and you know uh, you know how many people are you interviewing and take them over the process and sure you want to get a rough sense of that but those questions are not actually going to help enhance your candidacy right so you want to prioritize asking questions that are going to enhance your candidacy things that will expand the conversation um, you know asking them things about you know what they're excited about in the future of the company where they're headed um, you know showing that you're actually thinking sort of a couple steps ahead and being thoughtful about that rather than just asking transactional details is a way to enhance your candidacy rather than just getting information that you think you need um, the last thing is actually something to avoid doing uh, very often I see candidates writing out their answer particularly for how they're going to answer tell me about yourself on paper and I always tell people it's okay to have some paper around you to glance at and reference but you're not trying to recite something it will be very clear you're reciting it it will not come across organic and you won't be in the moment of really engaging thoughtfully and the other thing is they can actually hear it I mean I've actually heard uh, interviewers tell me that you know they heard the candidate shuffling through paper um, and you know it, it 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 made them feel like they were just running through a script rather than actually looking to engage and have a thoughtful conversation so uh, not only does it impact you in terms of optimizing your delivery but it also impacts the perception of uh, your approach so I'm going to pause there another quite a bit of content um, and, and open it up for uh, for questions there was one question I sent for you um, I don't know if you see it. Oh, I didn't uh, see it, Daryl. Uh, it says uh, anything. <clears throat> it says anything different if it's a recruiter rather than HR. Yeah, a recruiter instead of HR. Got it. So, like a, a third-party recruiter, as opposed to an in-house recruiter, I presume is what the question means. Um, yeah, I I would say that a um, a third-party recruiter. Uh, in a sense, a lot of times will be a little bit looser about thinking about a candidate because a lot of what they're solving for is numbers, right? They want to pass as many candidates as possible and show velocity. So, you know, in some sense, the, it, it, I, I don't want to say they're an easier grade, but they're looking for all the reasons to push you forward as opposed to looking for reasons to disqualify you. Um, I think the one, the one sort of you want about it is that the questions you're going to ask right are going to be a little bit different right so when you're asking the uh, third party recruiter you know you're you know you you have to understand their success is going to be placing people um, and their success is, is a little bit different and so as a result you know to the extent that your question can be aligned with their success um, that's going to put you in a better spot, right? So asking them questions like, you know, hey, this is a really exciting opportunity, you know, at, towards the end you can ask them, like, what other aspects of my candidacy would it be helpful to expand on and describe and, you know, what else would they might be looking for that, you know, you think it would be helpful for me to talk through? So that way you're, you, you know, they'll, they'll be more open to sort of giving you the playbook a little bit and saying, hey, make sure you talk about A, B, and C. And the fact that you ask that also shows them that you're trying to make sure they're successful, not just that you're successful. Uh, I don't see any other questions, but I actually have a question, if people don't mind me sure. uh, inter interrupting. Um, I'm not sure I was doing stuff while you were speaking, uh, so I'm not sure if you addressed it or not, but do you, do you encourage people to dress in a certain way for a phone interview, even though obviously they can't see you or anything, feel yeah. you, but, but I, you know, do you encourage people to dress up like they're actually going to an interview, or what, what would be your absolutely. advice? Uh, the short answer is absolutely. I think you can relax some of it in that you know you don't want to wear a jacket or a tie if it's feels a little bit uh, you know less comfortable but I mean I can tell you even for me in doing this webinar you know I've I've dressed in my business casual uh, clothing because it does put you in a certain frame of mind um, and, and frankly just like triggers your brain to be in a certain mode 
that I think, yeah, that, that is absolutely a good way to, um, you know, get your mind right, get you confident, and, and frankly, even your language will come across a different way when, when you're positioning yourself in that professional demeanor. Cool. All right. Cool. One. All right. Yeah. Uh, someone just sent me a question. I see here. I'll just go ahead and read it. It says, "I understand you mentioned the kind of questions to ask, but what if that? What if, what if that? I really. What if what if I'm really concerned about the timeline of the hiring process? Can I ask, and how I ask in a way that is good to me, or doing good sure. to me? Sure. 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 Um, great question. And so, you know, just to clarify. You should absolutely ask questions that are important to you. Um, you know, the, the, the point I was making is, you know, try, try, make sure you're asking questions that are important and relevant, not just asking transactional questions that are just informational. So specifically to that question, if the timeline is important, maybe you have other offers or for whatever reason there's certain urgency, um, I think there's a very respectful way to ask that and just say, hey, you know, I would love to learn, uh, you know, can you share more a little bit about the timeline? And either, you know, you could just sort of like leave it there. Can you share more about the timeline and just sort of leave it open-ended? Or particularly if there really is something pressing and you have to make a decision pretty quickly, I would actually tell them that, right? A recruiter will want to know that or uh, a hiring manager will want to know that and saying, look, you know, um, you know, can you share more about the timeline? I am looking to make a decision in the next couple of weeks. I have a few more opportunities in the hopper. That's a very reasonable ask. And um, I think the one thing to be prepared for is when you state that, they might actually ask a follow-up question. They might actually ask you and say, you know, hey, who else are you interviewing with? Um, you know, or they might even ask you uh, more about those opportunities and just be ready to answer those. And I think you can be very candid and as transparent as you want to be, right? It's perfectly reasonable to punt on the question and say, you know, well, uh, I'd rather not say which those opportunities are. That's, that's reasonable. But often I encourage people to just, you know, state it. Um, unless, unless stating that answer is going to indicate some disconnect, like, hey, why are you interviewing that job? And also this one, that doesn't make sense. As long as it's not indicating some kind of disconnect, I think it's very reasonable to be transparent, and it just builds more trust with, uh, with the person interviewing you. All right, cool. Uh, they're starting to roll in. I would ask people yeah. that if, when you send questions, uh, you can use the uh, arrow to the right to direct the questions to, because <laughs> all of them are coming to me when you'd be sending them directly to the speaker. A uh, person asked, uh, what are some common mistakes people make? I'm assuming what are, what are common mistakes people make in a phone interview? What are common mistakes people make? Um, I mean, I mentioned a couple about like reciting and not treating it professionally. Um, I mentioned the part about, you know, even if you are a passive job seeker and being very active in the dialogue, I'm trying to think if there's anything I did not cover that is phone interview specific. Um, common mistakes. I think I, da, 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 da. yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, one potential mistake is to treat it as if you're interviewing them. Um, there, is, there is an art form here about interviewing the interviewer, but, but very much with a limited scope and time frame within that, right? So if you have 30 minutes for a phone interview, you don't want to be using 15 minutes of that just peppering them with questions, right? Um, you know, ultimately, the reason for the phone interview it is a mutual thing that you're trying. You're try they're trying to vet your interest and qualifications, and you're trying to vet the fit. But often, not often, occasionally, I have seen people who treat it the other way and are just grilling that person because that interviewer reached out to them, and I, and I think that can be uh, seen as as not being very respectful to the process. So that's probably maybe one that I didn't mention. Yeah. Uh, another question came in. Uh, what if the other person who interviews me, or assuming the person who's being interviewed, has a bad phone signal? Is there any answer? Yeah, and actually, I'm, I'm starting to see some of these come in, so I see the phone signal one now. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, that actually happened to me once, um, where the other person had a poor phone signal. I, I wish there was a great answer to it. Um, I think, you know, one thing I would consider if the person isn't able to rectify it, it's it's not unreasonable to very respectfully say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm having a difficult time hearing you. It looks like I have full signal. Um, 
you know, is there a landline I can call you from? Um, what I've also seen people do is just use the Wi-Fi calling. So sort of just, just I think, actively stating what, what the challenges you're encountering, giving them a couple options, or even saying, hey, I'm still very excited and happy to chat later. Um, but as long as you do that respectfully and show you're interested and, and you're excited, uh, you really can't go wrong. Uh, I think I'm seeing something come in. What suggestions do you have for actually participating in the thoughtful conversation? As an introvert engineer, I we are good at tech and even writing, but talking on the phone is saying undeveloped skill. Sure. Um, interesting one. Yeah, you know, actually, uh, I get a lot of people that, that you know, uh, talk about, you know, being introverts and, uh, I'll tell you that on my Meyer Briggs, if you guys know that personality test, I am also uh, an introvert. Um, and what I think it's important to disaggregate um, what we mean when we say introvert, right? So by the Meyer Briggs definition, an introvert is somebody that uh, gets their energy internally, right? They don't get they, they're spending energy when they're talking to others and externalizing things about their candidacy. And um, what I always tell people is. You know, your goal is not to play some role that is inauthentic to you. You're not trying to act. You're really trying to give clarity into who you are. And to the extent that you think of it as an exercise in clarity and less of an exercise in, you know, how to put on a show, that can actually sort of avoid this concern about being an introvert, right? So imagine if one person interviews and they have, tons of like external energy and they're very uh, excitable and their volume is loud, but they're not being clear about their candidacy, that's not going to go very far. So what I always tell introverts uh, is like focus on like what are the core parts of your candidacy? Why do you want this job? Why are you exceptionally skilled? What is the work you've done? Focus on that. And the second thing I would say is pick a couple things that you're passionate about. Pick something that you really like. You know, I work with a ton of software engineers, and a lot of times what they love doing is like working on the latest frameworks or the latest technologies, innovating, solving problems. Make sure you talk about things you like doing because when you do that, your energy level will naturally sort of resonate. Your, um, you'll start smiling. Um, your body language will actually communicate over the phone, believe it or not. So. You know, think about it as clarity and think about it as talking about things you really enjoy doing because those things will shine through and they're not going to put you at a disadvantage, um, you know, over somebody that might be more extroverted because really what you're solving for is, is those, those two other things. Yeah. Uh, um, real quick, uh, Nick says this is an excellent interview, I mean, an excellent webinar, so I wanted to relay that to you. And I have uh, one, uh, one question that came in that says, uh, how to answer the question of biggest accomplishment so far. Uh, he says, can you give examples to show how not to be arrogant and not to be modest, not to be too modest? Yeah, it's a, it's a great one. And I see another question that came in, which I'll answer right after this. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting. I will tell you that um, most people I speak with, probably 80 plus percent, tend to be on the spectrum of being overly modest to the point where, frankly, it's self-deprecating. Um, and I'll go back to my to the prior answer I gave, and I think the, the objective here is clarity, right? It's not to be boastful. It's not to um, make something up. It's clarity. And if you think about it as clarity and you think about it as I'm going to tell you a series of facts and weave them together into a story, um, then it's hard for that to be seen as boastful, right? So I'll give an example. Imagine that, you know, I'll come up with something big, like you, uh, you launched a new product into the market and that product got a million users in a month. Now, wow, that's an exceptional accomplishment, right? And some people might be worried to talk about that because they'll think to themselves, well, I wasn't the only one responsible for that. If I say some big lofty number, it's going to be seen as, uh, boastful. If I keep saying I did this, I did that, it's going to sound too self-centered. But keep in mind, this is about clarity. So in that example, if you simply said, sure, I'm going to tell you about one of my proudest accomplishments. Um, and the one I'm going to talk through is when I launched a product that I was very passionate about, 
brought it out to the market, and we hit some really strong user goals that I was very proud of uh, and our team was very proud of. And then you walk them through it. You say, well, here's what I did, right? I talked to 100 customers. I spec'd out the design. I did – as long as you provide that in like a series of sort of sequential things that you did, right, and it's less and, – and it's precise and it's clear, right, and it's not just filled with flowery words, people will see that you're just sharing the facts and you're just sharing what happened. And generally I tell people, err on the side of, you know, feeling a little uncomfortable like you're bragging just because most often people are doing the opposite. Um, I have a question here. Do you have any advice specific to women to help deflect gender bias in interviews? Um, it's an interesting one. Uh, you know, one thing I, I, I will say that sort of relates to the prior question um, about 70% of my clients are actually uh, women, and, and I'm also an executive coach uh, for a few women. And one characteristic that has been shown uh, in studies and that I've seen a lot, of, a lot of my female clients is that there is a natural predisposition to be very humble and a bit self-deprecating. And so, you know, I don't have a great answer for how you avoid the gender bias on the other side, from if that person, uh, you know, is, is is sort of has some implicit bias based on gender or uh, based on any other factor. But what I will say is, the things that you can control is how you go about telling your story. So that that part I was mentioning about self-deprecation and being overly immod, uh, modest, um, I think that's important to consider for everybody. But I find that even more so for a lot of my female clients is. Before you go to that phone interview or that in-person interview, taking a moment to reflect on what makes you an exceptional candidate, right? What makes you good for this job? I think often people are underselling themselves going into that, right? They go in saying, hey, I, I have three of the five things you're looking for. I don't really have the other two. I'm kind of good. Uh, I'm interested, and I can learn, right? Um, but look, this is this is your time. This is your story. So take a step back, ask yourself, like, have I really thought about all the things I've done? Have I really thought about three reasons why I'm great for this job? I think to the extent that you focus on those things, um, it can at least mitigate some of the bias that, uh, that may be there. And that's probably the number one thing I tend to see is that self-deprecation just, just coming through and, and hurting your candidacy a bit. Cool. Uh, do you, do you have any more questions when you're in? Um, looking, no, it doesn't look like it. All right, because so, um, I don't have any questions over here, and we are approaching the three o'clock uh, time frame, and we don't want to partake keep you longer than we promised. Um, did you have any closing remarks that you want to give? Um, yeah, I I will just say that um, you know the people who join this webinar, I, I generally find people who who call me, people are looking into interview coaching, they're interested. It, I generally find that these are people who are exceptionally talented and great at what they do. And the gap that they're solving for is how do I externalize and connect the dots between what I know I'm capable of and what I want to communicate I'm capable of. And so, you know, there's a lot of things you can spend time on. You can work on communication skills. You can work on, uh, you know, uh, you, you, can, you can work on your resume. Like, there's a lot of things you can do. The one thing I would encourage everybody to do, and I would frankly do this when you're in a job, not just when you're interviewing, but do it, you know, maybe every at least twice a year, maybe four times a year, is just write out two types of things. One, what are the things that make you distinctive, exceptional, good? Like what, what, are, what is your value proposition to an organization, right? Uh, write those out, keep maybe a running Google Doc on it, write those out, have that clarity for yourself so that you've already sold yourself on your candidacy for anything. And that if you were to serendipitously walk across, come across somebody, um, you can very quickly talk about what you're good at, what you love doing. And not in a commercial way, but you just need that clarity. You don't want to be digging for it 
when the moment arrives. So that's number one is constantly be updating that part of your uh, internal story on what you're good at and what you and, and, and what you enjoy. And the second thing is start keeping a running list of your accomplishments. Whenever people want to go back and say, well, here are all the things I've done in my career, you're going to forget like 80% of it, right? A lot of those are buried in just the day-to-day -day work. Sometimes they're buried in old feedback uh, uh, reviews you've received. And so you can even copy paste it when you get your feedback, you know, a couple times a year or you get a great email from somebody saying you did something great. Just like put it in a Google Doc or where, wherever you keep shared information. I think doing those two things, keeping them, you know, the information on things that you're good at and the things that you've accomplished, um, that's going to give you exceptional clarity. So you're not just thinking about interviewing at any point in time, but, but all the time you're ready to tell your story. That's what I would leave you with. Well, thank you very much. And we, I, I want to say thank you for my Triple E for pro providing us this, this insight. Um, people have been sending questions about uh, the, the webinar and if they can uh, review, uh, review it. It, it, is, it, blah. it has been recorded, and we will be putting it up on the IEEE USA website probably either later on Friday or first thing Monday morning. So uh, you can just go back to the IEEE USA website, uh, uh, the webinar section, and look at the uh, recordings, and you will find this particular webinar. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar, but I, I want to, again, say thank you for providing your insight for us, and uh, we look forward to maybe possibly having you back in the future. Thank you all for the opportunity. I hope everybody who is on this gets a meaningful career that they're excited about. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and I will be turning off the webinar now. Uh, again, if you want to attend future webinars for IEEE USA, just go back to our, uh, our website and look at the webinar section. We have a number of good webinars coming up. Thanks so much. I'm ending the webinar. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye. Ciao.